Welcome back, everybody. Wow, what an amazing quarter by Tesla and what an even more amazing uh, earnings call that we had between Zach, Drew, Elon, and the entire Tesla team. However, today we are not looking amazing when it comes to the stock price. There is a very clear uh, disassociation between the stock price and the company. And I think a lot of people on Wall Street do not understand what they heard. And so hopefully in this episode, we can talk about the lunacy that's going on in the market. We can talk about what we heard and we can talk about, you know, some things that even watching some other YouTubers I follow, you know, and they do a lot of great stuff, but some stuff that I noticed none of them actually picked up on either. So Hopefully, uh, you know, this episode helps bring some clarity and, you know, tries to bring some some logic and common sense to the reality of what we're seeing right now, because the stock market, there is no common sense there. There's no reality there. It is so disconnected. Uh, before we do that, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. We're just going to get right into it today. So let's first off, take a look at the stock price here. So right now it's at $833. I mean, just look at this. If we look at, you know, the one minute chart for today and we just zoom out here, it has been nothing but a straight down path. This is unreal. If we look at it from our perspective, same thing, right? Oh, let's, let's zoom in here. Look at this. Every single hour, it's been nothing but a red candle. So it's going down. Um, why i don't know it, you know I, I will say this shouldn't be that big of a surprise I, i'm surprised to see it down 11 percent, and it keeps dropping 103 dollars you know after the earnings we just had just blows my mind away um but it's not surprising after a tesla earning call you know we always see tesla drop for some reason and then within three days after the analysts finally you know understand what they just saw and what they heard and really try to break it down Tesla starts to rebound a little bit, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen this time. Uh, you know, we might be here for with some pain for, for quite some time, but let's talk about what actually happened and what everybody's missing. So, so let's start off here uh, with the Q4 uh, update. This is the slide uh, slideshow that we had. Uh, let me see if I can. There we go. That's better. This is a slideshow that uh, Tesla put out. I'm just going to call out some highlights. A again, I'm sure you've seen some of the other YouTubers out there, and, and they've covered uh, a lot of good stuff here. Uh, but you know, I'll touch on some things uh, that I think were important, but we won't spend too much time here because there's plenty of other content talking about this out there. Um, but let me zoom in here a little bit. All right. So first of all, operating cash flow less capex was 2.8 billion in Q4. 2.8 billion in total. 1.5 billion increase on our cash and cash equivalents. So they have a total of 17.6 billion sitting on the books now, just in cash, just for them to spend. Right. Th that's unreal. They are officially at a point where they have a cash problem where they they, they they can't spend fast enough in order to even make this come down a little bit. Right at this point, it's not money isn't an issue for Tesla. The issue for Tesla is manpower, brain power, good engineers. Right, that that's where where the, the bottleneck is at this point. Uh, so let's scroll down here. Uh, profitability, all this was really good. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some of the the hits onto the actual balance sheet, onto operating expenses that came up, and a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, but here's going to be the theme. Full self driving is the theme. So let's, let's read this note right here. They decided, right? This isn't something they normally put in these notes, but you'll see as I go through the course of this video that full self-driving is, it, I think it's a lot closer than everyone thinks. I think we'll have it this year. I'm, I'm very, very convinced of this. So they write full self-driving software remains one of our primary areas of focus. Over time, our software related profit should accelerate our overall profitability. More importantly, full self-driving is a key component to improve automobile safety as well as further accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy through higher utilization of our vehicles. Okay, cool, Nick. So what? That's not anything that tells us it's going to happen today, right? We'll get to that. I just want to point out this theme that we see over and over of, about full self-driving. Um, here that you can see you know, the record amount of vehicles. They're at a 1.22 million run rate if we uh, annualize out Q4 numbers. Um, so here we can see while 2021 was a defining year for our company, we believe we are just at the very early stages of our journey. Thank you for being part of it. So that's great. All right. So here automotive revenues, uh, just shy of 16 billion. You can see automotive gross margins, 30.6%. And even if you back out the, uh, the, 
the tax credits or the um the energy credits we're still at 29 uh let's see if they have it here uh i don't see it but it well they had it up here Tw 29.7 i believe uh, where is it? All right here, 29.2, 29.2% 29 X credits. All right. That's best in class is better than any other automotive company out there. Uh, literally by two to three times. If we come down here, th what I really want to call out is right here. Um, so our operating income improved to 2.6 billion Q4 compared to the same period last year, resulting in a 14.7 operating margin. This profit level was reached while incurring SBC expense attributed to the 2018 CEO award and $245 million um, in, in Q4, dr uh, driven by the final two operational milestones becoming, uh, becoming probable. Year-over-year, uh, -year, operating income was primarily impacted by the following items. And so you'll see here, here's the main one, $340 million for the payroll tax. So if you take this $340 million, you take this $245 million, you back those one-time payments out, this 14.7 is actually 16.2%. 16.2% with operating, uh, operating margins. That's wild. That's absolutely insane. This is what Wall Street completely missed when it comes to the numbers. They don't realize this, and it's growing faster and faster. They have two more factories coming on, right? It's just getting insane. Um, all right, quarter in cash. Uh, we kind of already talked about that. So here we can see some more of the breakdowns. I mean, you guys can look at these numbers. Uh, I don't think any of this is that crazy. Um, all right, so here we can see Tesla continues to sh uh, sandbag Shanghai, just saying greater than 450,000. Um, Cybertruck in development. Texas and Berlin, they're in equipment tests. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about those in a second here. Uh, okay, so here was one of the first things that we noticed. If we see here, uh, Europe, Berlin, equipment testing through, uh, through the vehicle production process started in late 2021. We are still in the process of finalizing manufacturing permit from local authorities, which will allow us to start delivery of German-made vehicles in Europe. These first vehicles would be built using 2170 cells. So you know, th th that's the cells they've been using, right? This 2000 series. So why is that important? Well, because if we come up here to the Texas, you'll notice that they talk about Giga Texas, but at no point do they mention using 2170 batteries. Well, remember that we'll, we'll touch on that in a second here. Coming down here, look at this. So autopilot and full self-driving, right? Th this is where things are starting to pick up with the full self-driving conversation. The team continued to iterate on full self-driving beta software, releasing seven updates throughout the quarter. Seven throughout the quarter. That's essentially one update every two weeks. We successfully increased the number of FSD beta vehicles from a couple thousand, 2,000 in Q3, to nearly 60,000 vehicles in the U.S. today. Can we just stop there for a second? This, this, this software that people say isn't real, isn't going to happen, that it's, it's so deadly and, so, you know, knock on wood here. But now 60,000 people have it. Nobody's been in a crash yet. It's making people drive safer, and it keeps expanding faster and faster. All right. They, they mentioned this here. So just, again, we're, we're going to keep pointing these things out. Down here, if we see um, gap, uh, you can see the operating margins here. I mean, you can see Tesla's just essentially outpacing everybody. In reality, this should probably be even higher if we, you know, uh, well, you guys get it. Okay. Um, what else? All right. So some cool pictures you can see here at the Fre uh, Fremont factory. This is cool. This is uh, outside of the Giga Berlin. Uh, this is the exteriors where they had those drone robots doing all the painting. Uh, another image from Giga factory. That kind of reminds me of the plaid unveiling. Here we can see Giga Berlin, the body shop. What else? General assembly line. That's a cool image. Here we can see Giga Texas, I believe. Yeah, Giga Texas is the exterior, just absolutely massive. I mean, I've never been to, to Austin to see this yet, but everybody who's been there just says, you know, it looks massive, but like being up next to it, you, you don't even realize how massive it really is. You know, based on what I've heard, I, I guess the length of it is about a mile long, just the length. And now you think of how many stories high it is, how wide it is. It's, it's impressive. Here's the inside from Giga Texas, General Assembly line, paint shop. Okay, look at this, Giga Texas. This is the structural pack with the, uh, with the seats for the vehicle being mounted onto the structural pack. Very interesting. And then here's a picture of Shanghai. What else we got here? All right, so we got just a few more pictures here, semi. Okay, so this is, this is huge. 
cumulative profitability since inception. So up until this point, right, if you took all of the profits Tesla has made and you took all of the, the losses, the debt that Tesla's made, they have technically been in the negative, right? If you accumulated all of it. But now, right now, if you look at it, Tesla is officially profitable as a company since their inception. So that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool uh, milestone to break. Um, all these charts here, the only thing you really have to pay attention is their direction up and to the right, up and to the right. That kind of says everything. All right. And then we have financial statements. So we're we're going to, we're going to stop here. We're going to move over into my notes I took during the earnings call. And so I'm going to share them here. Uh, keep in mind, I took these kind of, uh, hastily. So don't, you know, catch me for any grammar or spelling errors. Um, I, I'm going to just go through this, talk about what I heard and what I think other people might've missed and not really understood. And again, it's not really the YouTube community, right? I mean, they may, mainly, they all get this, right? But it's, it's wall street. It's the analysts, right? They're the ones that are missing on what just happened. This was, I think this was one of the most important calls we've ever had. It was probably the most profound call I've ever heard Elon uh, have on a quarterly earnings call. It, I, I, I do not understand how Wall Street is missing this. I don't understand how we're down 11% the next day. You know, it, it hurts. Trust me, I'm sick of this bleeding. Uh, I'm ready. I mean, hell, I, I would be fine with just a stabilization, right? Like we could stay flat for a while. I'm just sick of every day being down and down and down, especially when the majority of this is macro related, it's, it's very annoying. Okay. So first off, Elon start off with some opening remarks, talk about how, um, this was a, a breakthrough year. They grew 90% year over year while every other auto manufacturer essentially compressed. Um, they had high operating mar uh, they had the highest operating margin. See, I misspelled that. Uh, they had the highest operating margins in the industry above 14% gap. Uh, and like I said here, real numbers, probably like 16.8. Um, 5.5 billion in gap net income, just ridiculous in a quarter companies officially at break even for a lifetime. Uh, okay. So, and that's what we talked about at the end there. All right. So here Tesla will, Texas will start with model Y with structural pack and 4680 batteries. This is a huge deal. And it's amazing to me how no one, no analysts, nobody talked about this on the call. Um, I mean, the, the questions from investors came in talking about this, but you didn't hear any of the analysts really care about this. You haven't heard anything about the 4680 battery today yet. Whenever this battery day happened, what was it? 2020, everybody was saying, yeah, Tesla's talking about this. It's, so, it's a pipe dream. This is, you know, a, a decade away, all this stuff. And yet here we are, it's here, the 4680 battery, it's going into production and nobody's talking about it. Nobody cares about it. This is what's unbelievable. You know, it, it's like, it's just a, this dopamine effect because Elon told us they were working on this. People have just become numb to it. Like, yeah, you'll eventually do, you'll eventually do it. And now it's here. Nobody cares. So that's pretty wild. All right. So, and then he says the final search should be fairly soon for Giga Texas vehicles. And he anticipates, uh, the first vehicles being delivered by the end of quarter. And again, they'll be with the structural pack with the 4680 battery. So that's huge. Okay. So then he said, um, okay, so, uh, we'll look for and hopefully announce a new factory location this year by the end of this year. So in 2022, they're going to use this as the time to look for new factories. So he didn't say if it was one or two or three. I mean, who, who knows? But I would imagine I would imagine what he's going to do here is, well, you know, I, I really don't know. I, so I'll come back to this because I have a theory that I'm going to play out here, but I don't want to say it now because it kind of, you know, it, it, it takes all of the uh, the you know, excitement and the buildup of what I'm going to talk about, but I think there'll be, there'll be multiple factories that are going to happen here. And I don't think that it's going to be for any specific vehicles that we currently have. I, I think there's a bigger plan here. And so the announcement will be at the end of 2022 is what uh, Elon was saying. Um, he, Elon, this is Elon speaking also said, we expect significant growth comfortably above 50% growth in 2022 comfortably above this is the guidance okay and zach goes on to talk about this and to give even more concrete guidance on this but keep in mind 50 percent comfortably above 50 percent for 2022 so right current wall street analyst expectations anywhere from like 1.3 to 1.5 million and so that 1.5 million would be 50 percent right so he's saying comfortably above so they're already off the mark which i want i want them to be off the mark because that allows us a better chance to be Everything you see moving forward in green 
is related to full self-driving. And this is the flow of how the whole call went. So I just want to show you how much this got brought up. So Elon said, full self-driving will become the most important source of profitability for Tesla. If you run the numbers, it is nutty good. We will achieve full self-driving this year. That's his prediction that by in 2022, we'll achieve it. He also says full self-driving software update might be the biggest increase in value of any asset class in history. Again, misspelled there. Product roadmap. All right. So, so this is where, uh, you know, he started talking more about, you know, different products and then he eventually took some questions. Um, so he said they weren't going to cover everything, um, that he thinks some products deserve their own launch. So I thought that was interesting because I think this alludes to a product that they're not going to talk about, which is part of my, you know, theory of what actually happened. Fundamental focus is scaling output in 2022. So that's their main focus is increasing output, ramping up Berlin, ramping up Austin, getting, uh, excuse me, but <laughs> getting better efficiencies in Austin in, uh, in Fremont, expanding China and getting better efficiencies in China. Um, he said, so people started talking about new vehicles and $25,000 vehicles. And this is where wall street freaked out because Elon said that they will not be doing any new vehicles this year. There'll be no new announcement, right? So no cyber truck, no mythical $25,000 vehicle, nothing. And e what Elon said here is if we introduce a new vehicle, our numbers would have been the same. We are limited by chips. In other words, they have X amount of chips. So let's say they have 2 million uh, chips worth of vehicles that they can produce. What is the point of introducing the Cybertruck? What is the point of introducing a $25,000 vehicle if they don't have the chips to produce them? They already have more demand than what they know what to do with for X, for S, for Model Y and Model 3. Why would they add a new vehicle in there that they can't produce? There's no point. It makes zero sense. And, you know, for something like this, something that's so efficient and so pragmatic and, you know, cost effective in the way he's thinking and what they're doing, you would think Wall Street would reward that. Instead, we see negative 11%. Go figure that one out. Okay, so uh, uh, we will do, uh, he's, so he did it, uh, iterate, the, or um, he did say that we will do a lot of engineering and tooling to create those vehicles, Cybertruck, Roadster, Optimus, keep in mind he said Optimus there, and then he also said, in terms of priority of products for 2022, the most important product development we are doing this year is Optimus Humanoid Robot. This ties into full self-driving. All right, maybe I should have made this green because keep in mind, the software for Optimus will essentially come from the full self-driving, right? That software will carry over into the humanoid. And so in order for them to feel this strongly about Optimus, it tells you a little bit about where they are with full self-driving, right? as does the fact that they're at 60,000 um, beta testers now, and they were at 2,000 a quarter before, right? This kind of shows you their confidence. So then he also says this has the potential to be more significant than the vehicle business itself. All right, moving on. 4680. And a, a lot of the 4680 was actually spoken to by Drew. And so Drew talked about how 2021, uh, they worked on growing cell supply. So they worked on increasing the amount of batteries that they had. He said, today, sales from suppliers exceed um, our other factory constraints. In other words, batteries are not the bottleneck. Batteries are not the fundamental limitation right now. Chips are. Okay. And, and even other things, right? Uh, other parts. There's like 10,000 parts in a vehicle. The batteries are not the, the bottleneck at this point. So that's excellent news. While every other auto manufacturer is struggling to get chips and batteries for Tesla, batteries are not the, the limiter. Um, and then he said, 4680 is not a constraint for 2022. Building 4680 structural packs every day. Uh, he talked about how uh, Drew's been driving and testing the Model Ys in in Austin and that have the structural pack, have the 4680 battery. So, so this is real. This is coming again. Nobody's talking about it, even though this is such a big thing. Uh, essentially, once 4680 ramps, it cuts the cost of battery in half. You can do more with less, charge faster, more efficient, better, better, um, better drive with the vehicle, better performance. No one's talking about this. He said the cell factory in Austin is underway and some parts already being produced. And what he's talking about is the actual production line for the 4680 battery within free, uh, within Austin. It's already underway. They're already tooling it. They're already practicing, making parts, things of that nature. Um, yeah. And, and then he made this nice point that I, I think this, this just shows you how contrary they are to other automatic, uh, automotive companies out there. 
He says, we are bringing everything into one factory in Texas. And Elon has talked about this, how the offices, the lines, right? Everything is right there, right? If you look outside the window of your office, there's the line. And the idea is, you know, how it's no different than transporting vehicles, right? If I build a vehicle from Shanghai, I have to deliver it to, to Germany. That's going to be, there, there's more of a disconnect there, right? It's less efficient than if I have a factory in Berlin to deliver a vehicle to Berlin. Right. And so it's the same thing goes here. If the if the management, if the engineers are there with the product in line with the people doing doing the work. Right. It just it, it fosters a better culture. It fosters, you know, better efficiencies, more creativity, more collaboration. A lot of good stuff comes from this. All right. So 2022 uh, limiting factors chips. Uh, he says, <laughs> wow, I really couldn't spell. He says that this should uh, alleviate uh, next year with, when it comes to chips. Uh, then we transition into a cell limit, which is where the 4680 battery will become very important. So what he's saying is 2022 4680 battery will not be limited. We do not have any cell issues for 2022. However, 2023, once we can get rid of this bottleneck of the chips and now we can move even faster, well, that's when the 4680 batteries can be really important. It's going to be really important that we can make even more batteries because we have our own uh, production in-house. Again, something everybody's underestimating. Okay, next up, Zach spoke. And all these were first um, were opening remarks, so uh, keep that in mind. Zach here, I think Zach had some of the most impactful statements on this call. Keep in mind, Elon, he may say things are grandiose. Zach does not. Zach is very calculated. He has no room, no time to BS us, all right? Under his tutelage, if you will, <laughs> uh, under, his, under his reign as master of coin, Zach has had two quarters that were not profitable. Every other quarter, profitable. Zach is on top of what he's doing. He doesn't want to uh, give people the wrong impression or over-promise and under-deliver, right? Not what he does. All this talk, it makes me thirsty. All right. So he called 2021 financially transformative. OPEX margins trending up. That's great. Auto gross margins grew to 29.2%, which is ridiculous. Operating expenses were impacted by taxes for Elon selling and the CEO compensation. So when Elon did all his selling in 2021, right, that created a, a taxable event. So, you know, Tesla had to, you know, pay for that. So I think it was $350 million they had to pay. And then for the CEO compensation, I think it was 245, 250 million. So all of that weighed down onto the operating expenses, right? Which in effect has an effect on the operating margin. So even though he had a record-breaking operating margin, keep in mind, it was suppressed by six, 650 roughly million dollars weighing that down of one-time expenses that you'll never see again. So he says uh, that they also have continued to retire legacy and high interest debt, which they should have like no debt at this point. Um, okay, so here we go. He says, uh, we plan to grow over 50%. Uh, our plans show that this is achievable with just Shanghai and Fremont factories. For some time, they have been running slower due to supply uh, constraint. So, so uh, let me unpack this. Their goal is 50% year over year for the foreseeable future. Right now, analysts have predicted that Tesla will hit 1.3 to 1.5 million vehicles for 2022. With just Shanghai and just Fremont, Zach is saying, Zach, not Elon, Zach is saying that they can hit 1.5 million with just those two factories. Meanwhile, Berlin and Austin are about to come online. Think about that. This is Zach saying this, which just blows my mind. And what's even crazier is that, is that he mentioned how they've actually been making less vehicles than what they can because of this chip shortage. So that means that these factories aren't even really flexing the real muscles, right? They're not really, you know, doing all they can do. They, they haven't you know, completely, we haven't seen the limit of these factories yet. I mean, and think about this, Fremont is still growing so fast and is still doing better and better and producing more vehicles after all these years. So what about Shanghai? What's that going to look like? Yeah. And don't forget Shanghai is getting the expansion. that will be done in April. So there's so much going on here. And then Zach brought up full self-driving again. He said, rapid development of full self-driving software margins will help. Okay. So he makes one mention there. So then we go into the Q&A. Um, and 
you know, people ask about the $25,000 vehicle and Elon says, we're not currently working on a $25,000 car. At some point we will. Okay. We have too much on our plate right now. And then he says, I think this is the wrong question. Really what overwhelmingly matters is when is the car autonomous and the cost drops for moving, uh, for, for moving people. And I put here, uh, from point A to point B, because what Elon is saying is forget about a $25,000 vehicle. Okay. That the real question is when we have robot taxis or when we have just autonomous vehicles where, where Tesla can make a Uber like app and anybody can just add their vehicle when they're not using it into that, into that fleet. At what point, right? Like at what point does the cost become so low where it's almost irrelevant to even own a car unless you want to, unless it's just a luxury item, right? At what point is it cheaper to, to get into a robo taxi because going from point A to point B costs so little that you would never own a vehicle, right? So who cares about the $25,000 vehicle? What would you pay for that software? Right. And imagine you as an individual, if you are the one with the vehicle and you're putting out there to work for you and you're getting paid for that, think of all these Uber drivers out there. Imagine they could not have to go out in the car and be in the car while it does this work. And it's just an extra stream of income for them. At what point does that happen? Right. That is the real question. And I think the reason he said that they're not currently working on a $25,000 car is because they think full self driving is coming a lot faster than we think. And I'm not going to give away what I really think because I'll get to that in a second here, but you can slowly start to see this build up. So then somebody also asked about HVAC and it was interesting because they said it's completely aligned with our mission. Um, we are doing it, well, we're doing it in a vehicle is much harder because it's a lot more constrained, it's a lot smaller, you know, space. We have to think about the weights. There's so much more that we have to think about. Whereas in a house, in a, a static environment, you know, where it's not moving and we don't care about space constraint, right? All the limiting factors in a vehicle essentially don't exist with a house. And so what they're saying is that this is definitely a thing that we're going to do an HVAC system for houses. It's just a matter of, you know, when, not if, and, and they need time, right? They, you know, they have so much on their plate that, you know, it's just not at the top of the list right now, but Tesla's going that way. They're doing solar roofs. They're doing the, the power walls, you know, HVAC's just a logical next sense. The vehicle plugs into the house, right? I mean, it's just part of that ecosystem. Next question was talking about Dojo, if it was on track for summer of 2022, and if it was necessary for full self driving. Um, and Elon said Dojo appears to be on track. Um, he also, here you go in green, says the threshold that matters is at what point does the team tell us we want to use Dojo? So what Elon's saying here is that, all right, so Dojo is the supercomputer that they're developing in-house. And the whole idea is this supercomputer is being used to develop uh, training for neural nets, right? To iterate on it very quickly. Currently, what they're leveraging is these um, high, highly um, uh, power, very powerful uh, GPU clusters, right? These uh, graphical processing units, right? Think of like three-dimensional version of, of a CPU, right? So, but these GPUs uh, are in these clusters and you have all of these servers and they're just all essentially stick together to represent one uh, hopefully homogenous cluster to, to whatever software is being developed. All right, so right now that's what they're using. And this GPU cluster is, is ridiculous, right? It's a supercomputer, right? It's the fifth most powerful supercomputer in the world. Well, again, tangentially, um, Tesla is working on Dojo, which is supposed to be a next level supercomputer that is built purposely from a hardware perspective for neural nets. So what Elon is saying here is the threshold to decide when Dojo is ready is when the team developing the full self-driving software says, Hey, we no longer want to use our GPU cluster. We want to use Dojo. At that point, that's when you know Dojo is ready. And so that's a constantly moving, you know, target, right? GPU clusters keep getting better and better, right? And, and Dojo needs to not only get better, but they need to, you know, get better, better faster so they can overtake these GPU clusters. So the, the whole, it's more of like uh, having a gym buddy right? Where you go to the gym with someone who keeps you accountable and is someone there. You don't want to be the biggest, um, biggest fish in, in the, in the pond, right? You, you want to be able to grow. And so 
these GPU clusters are, are that for Dojo, right? So it's kind of like this little competition internally to see, to, to help push Dojo to become even better. And will it be successful? Elon talked about it several times, who knows, maybe it won't. But the idea is to, to let the team developing full self-drive and determine when it's time to cut over to Dojo. It's when they want it, that's when we'll do it. Okay, so, so then the real question, is Dojo necessary for full self-driving? Elon says no. Uh, absolutely not. Um, okay, so this was interesting too. So he, here's the bigger, he, Tesla has almost an endless amount of total addressable markets. We, we know about the cars, right? We know about supercharging. We know about batteries. Uh, we have Tesla insurance, right? I mean, full self-driving, robo-taxis. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But then here we have again, he talks about how if Dojo is competitive, we would offer it to other companies that would want to do neural net training. So now think of a AWS, an Azure, a Google, uh, Google uh, GCP, I forget what it stands for, Google Compute Platform, yeah, GCP type offering <laughs> by Tesla, right? So it's just, it's ridiculous. There's another addressable market. Um, somebody asked what, was, what would be the first use for, a, for uh, Optimus, the humanoid? And uh, Elon said probably uh, something within the factories, you know, moving things from point A to point B, right? Just little basic things of that nature. Um, if they don't have a utility for, for Optimus, then why would anyone else was Elon's logic. And obviously we would test it on ourselves before we test it on other people. And so, you know, it, it, it's more than just that, right? It's like, it's the de dexterity to pick something up, the understanding of how much force do you need to hold a wrench or how to angle yourself to torque it, right? Th those little things are very finesse and we take them for granted, but, you know, our dexterity is something that's very hard to, to mimic. All right, so now we get back to Zach. And Zach talks about Tesla insurance. Yeah, another total addressable market to add to the fold, right? He says, currently Tesla insurance is offered in five states. The plan is by end of the year to, to have it in not 80% of states, but in 80% of places where our customers are, is what he said. So I don't know if that wording was specific or not, but the idea is this is about to expand quickly by the end of the year. And then he also said, uh, then, you know, maybe by the end of the year, we'll turn to the European market. Um, but I think that's a little more aspirational. But, but the idea is it's growing, right? It's not something that's going to be slow. Um, it may feel slow because every single uh, insurance is regulated at the state level. So there's, you know, a, each state has their own idiosyncrasies for how to do this, but it's, it's something to be aware of. Okay. So um, let's see where we at here. Uh, it's 411. Um, okay. Um, let's actually take a look here real quick. All right. Uh, looks like we closed at 829 and we're down even more down to 821. So we keep dropping here, folks. All right, well, let's get back to it. Yeah, red day, huh? Um, okay, so obstacles for Cybertruck. So again, someone talked about this. Um, Elon, the, the fundamental obstacle for Cybertruck, to sum this all up, was that with Cybertruck, there's a lot of cool tech in it, but it's going to be very expensive is what it seems like to have everything possible in there. So where can we be more efficient so that we can make it a affordable product? Because at the end of the day, they don't want this to be a product that only the wealthy can have. They want to make it a mass product, hopefully producing 250,000 vehicles a year. So that's the goal of Cybertruck. You know, batteries aren't a limiting factor. It's just they haven't finished the design. All right. So now we're getting to more of the real interesting stuff. So questions about margins, um, this was something that Zach pretty much took over. And he said, you know, first of all, he said with the margins, they keep getting better because the Model Y is becoming more and more um, of, a, of an increasing uh, part of the fold between 3 and Y. And Model Y has better margins. It's a more expensive vehicle. It's more cost effective to, to build. So Model Y is huge. Um, he also says that as we look over the next uh, quarter or two, uh, we have ramp inefficiencies from Austin and Berlin and inflationary pre pressure. So it's a lot of uncertainty around that. And I think that's Zach kind of, you know, hedging a little bit here saying, you know, we're, we're ramping up two factories at the same time, right? Th that may weigh on our margins. So keep in mind of that. And then also, you never know with inflation, right? We don't know what's going to happen here. Um, so this is where things get interesting. Then Zach says, you know, when it comes to, to the margins, what you really should be focused on is the software. He says the software portion of the business, misspelling, is what we should really be paying attention to. He says, I prefer to drive with FSD beta turned on. 
quite a bit of an upside from a margin perspective. This is Zach saying this. Zach is saying that he prefers to drive with FSD beta turn on, and he's talking about the leverage that they're going to have from this software. Elon also goes on to say everything pales in comparison to the value of full self-driving or robo taxis. I have never seen Elon talk this much about this. He goes on to says anyone who has been in the beta program, if you just plot the intervention, the interventions per mile, it is trending to a very small interventions per mile in Innovation is happening fast, and several profound changes are coming to full self-driving in the next few few months. What he's talking about there is the full stack, right? Version 11, where essentially he takes, you know, the, the, the parking, the highway, the city streets, and that he consolidates it down into one stack. And on top of that, they're going to take out the post-process uh, that cameras do, right? They're going to take that step out of it and take just a full raw photon, photon counts that, that our cameras get. So this is something that we, you know, we as humans, the reason all this compression and this beautification of these images happen is for us and for our, our eyes, but computers don't need that, right? Computers can actually see a, just a, a black wall and understand, yeah, there's a trash can there. There's a, a car parked over there. There's a little kid crossing the street, right? Just because the computer can see the, the subtleties and the difference in, in each pixel, right? Each photon that, that comes back and it, the computer is able to understand what it sees. We can't because we only have, you know, s such a, we, we have a minimal amount of, of color shades we can see, you know, with our cones, but computers don't have this limitation. So that's going to be, so that plus the compressed stack, right? All in one, right? That's going to be a profound change. Then Elon says, I would be shocked if we do not achieve full self-driving safer than a human this year. I would be shocked. So never, ever have we heard Elon be this emphatic about full self-driving. Never, ever have we heard Zach talk about it like this. Never, ever have we had 60,000 beta testers, essentially quarter over quarter. We went from 2,000 to 60,000. This is happening very quickly. And also... Let, let me go ahead and, you know, put out there my theory. The $25,000 vehicle everyone's talking about, right? And, and let me, well, you know what? Hold off. I, I'll come back to that because there's one more part here that really ties everything together. Um, energy, um, pretty much uh, the whole conversation with energy, why did energy go down a little bit? Very straightforward. They robbed chips from the energy side to build more vehicles because vehicles are more profitable. It's really that straightforward. All right, so this is uh, slowly where we get into what, what I was really talking about with, uh, with uh, full self-driving. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not keeping you too long. Um, somebody asked a question about R&D. They asked, uh, do you have an incubator? Do you guys have uh, research centers? And you know, there's almost a laugh across, across the board on the call. Everyone's saying, nope, no incubators, no research centers. And uh, you know, they say, um, uh, you, you know, we just build things and then we decide if it's something that's useful and something we can do well and something we can scale and then we build it. And then Elon says, way too much value is given to ideas versus execution. Again, look at GM, look at Ford, uh, look at Volkswagen, all these things they're announcing, yet what are they doing for execution? GM has made an endless amount of announcements and they've delivered 20 something, 20, 26 vehicles last year, 27 vehicles in Q4. Where's the execution on there? Yet they're treated like they're the leaders in EVs, right? Um, Okay, so then somebody asked the qu uh, question about the progress uh, for the take rate and margins for full self-driving. And so, so then somebody said, or Elon said, with full self-driving, you don't want to be looking at the rear view mirror. Uh, it would not be a good indicator. You need to look out the front window because it is such a profound step change. Every car will eventually have full self-driving. And then he says, full self-driving will make it cheaper than a bus, than a subway. $2 to go 10 miles. No one would take a bus or a subway. People don't understand how profound this will be. It's not some little feature. It is the most profound software maybe in history. I don't actually know how to quantify it. It's a big number. All right, so, so, so that's what Elon says. And so now like, let me get into my theory. The $25,000 vehicle. The reason they are not working on it, the reason they're not talking about it, the reason they haven't unleashed it, is because if you can't tell, they are very confident about full self-driving. They are convinced they're going to have it this year. They are convinced. Zach's talking about it. Elon's talking about it, right? Two to 60,000. 
My prediction is we will never see a $25,000 vehicle. It will not happen. If we see anything, it will be a robo taxi vehicle. It will be a vehicle that requires no steering wheel. It will be a vehicle that requires no pedals. It will be a very cost effective vehicle to produce that will be, that will have crazy margins for Tesla. And that will allow people to travel from point A to point B at a ridiculously cheap cost. This is what, why I think, uh, you know, this is why I think it's, it's very clear that they're not gonna make a $25,000 vehicle. Right, I think with the way they see it is we're going to be in a world where you, if, if that's your price range, you won't need a vehicle. It'll, make, it'll be more expensive for you to own a vehicle than to just call one up on your Tesla app. Right, I, That's where we're going. And this is what Elon is trying to get across to people. And this is why people, you know, again, down like this in aftermarket is down 11% today. It, it, it makes zero sense. So then somebody asks, can you meet these numbers without the $25,000 car? Someone says 3.2 million vehicles in 2024 uh, would be if they continue 50% year over year. And it says here, if there is no $25,000 car a vehicle being worked on, is it realistic to believe you can deliver this? And Elon laughed, right? The second that, that, that someone mentioned $25,000 vehicle, Elon laughed again. And Elon's response, it is apparent from the question that the gravity of full self-driving is not appreciated. If the cost of our cars do not drop at all, we would still sell as many as we could possibly make, right? If that's not a mic drop, I don't know what is. Look, at the end of the day, even if Tesla made no $25,000 vehicle and they kept all their vehicles at the same price, but they saw full self-driving, the value of those cars, the desire for those cars would be so high, it wouldn't matter. Tesla could not make enough. Right, the second a vehicle can drive itself, it, maybe one or two percent of people wouldn't want it. The rest of the population are going to want it. They're all going to want it. And here's my question to you: How long is the gap between the time Tesla solves this and there's a player number two? How long? And then when that player number two does come up, do you trust them? They haven't been doing it as long as Tesla. Does theirs work as well? Right? It, or is it like looking at Waymo and it kind of gets stuck and you need help? Right? These are the questions you have to ask yourself. D does Tesla full self driving become what Google is and anything else becomes like Microsoft Bing, which nobody uses? D do we go from an iPod to a, to a Zoom? Is that what it looks like? Right? I, I think this, this will become a, a one, one market, you know, or, or a one person takes all. Right? At this point, why would Tesla? Tesla, the smartest thing Tesla would do at this point would be to license it out to other auto manufacturers, right? Because at that point, nobody's going to work on it themselves if they just license it out, right? Why would they waste money doing that? Now they have to spend money to try to make their cars even more efficient, right? It, it, just, it just becomes just crazy, right? The scale of this will just become crazy. And so, so this is what everybody missed, all right? With the numbers, people miss that there are these one-time charges. And even with that, Tesla still beat analyst expectations. Okay. Even with that. And now on top of that, everybody wants to hear about $25,000 vehicle. Everybody wants to hear about a new model. Yet Tesla's telling you, look, we already cannot make more vehicles, right? We, we are so constrained. Adding a new vehicle that costs less, if we made that, that would mean less revenue for the company. We have these vehicles selling for $50,000 each. And we are at capacity. We cannot make them fast enough. And your question, you're wondering about a $25,000 vehicle? What are you talking about? Meanwhile, Tesla's sitting here telling you about full self-driving. We'll be ready this year is what he's saying. And it's not just him. You hear Zach talking about it. On top of that, they're saying that Optimus is the, the most important product for this year. That's the most important thing that they're going to be working on. Now, why would that be unless full self-driving was that close? Why? Think about it. The, the, the humanoid robot will be something that essentially replaces labor, even if it didn't, even if it didn't get good enough, or even if it took a, you know, two decades to get good enough to replace somebody doing some laborious tasks that no one wants to do. You tell me if that, if the autonomous, uh, if, if Optimus, the humanoid, if it could in your house, do your dishes, put away the dishes, fold your laundry, put it away, um, clean up the house, uh, make dinner for you. 
Are you telling me you would not pay a lot of money for that? That would be a huge product. You'd be getting all this time back, all this time value, all this time you spend doing other things. This is what people are missing. And it's, it's, it boggles my mind that people still bet against Elon, right? Even the, the most recent thing, the 4680 battery, two years ago, people were saying, yeah, that's going to, it will never happen. You can't do, you can't do a tablet. You can't do dry electrodes, right? Like people were saying this yet. Hey, here we are. They're in vehicles now. So look, tough day in the market today. Trust me. It hurts, right? I, I'm, I'm feeling the pain. It, it's hard to, you know, see these kind of drops and not feel a little emotional about it. Um, you know, I, I'm not as at peace as I normally am. Uh, even though I'm a long-term investor, right? I, you know, it, it still it still weighs on me. Uh, it, it weighs on our family, and it's it's a real thing. Um, so I empathize with you. Uh, if you're there, all I can say is we you know, we got to think about the bigger picture. And and in reality, I would I would rather be where I'm at now than in five, ten years from now, saying to myself, "Oh my God, I knew this was gonna happen, and I chickened out. I left." It was so obvious and I got scared and I stopped investing in the company. I don't want to be, because at that point, that's something I'm gonna have to live with for the rest of my life, rather than this short-term pain. Short-term pain for long-term gain, right? Think about that. Later today, you know, if, if you made it to the end of this video, just sit there and think about how you would feel if in five, 10 years from now, it's at a 10, $15,000 share stock and you're sitting there thinking, man, I had, I had 200 shares, 300 shares of this company that life-changing money could have been made. Yet you're sitting here, you know, 10 years later thinking, man, I could not be working. I could be free. I could be, you know, living in Paris for a week, going down to Costa Rica for a month, right? But no, instead I have to work my nine to five now because I didn't, I, I didn't trust myself and I let the market dictate what I should do versus looking at the company itself. Those are just my thoughts. None of this financial advice, just an engineer giving you my two cents. All right, if you made it to the end, thank you for sticking around. Uh, help us out, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. I love you all, congrats to Tesla. Ignore the market, it makes no sense. I'll catch you guys next time, peace.